Hello, my name is Carlos Evaristo, and I am the director of the Oriana Foundation, founded by John Hafford to study the history of Portugal in the light of the Fatima message. I am also a religious commentator and researcher for the state-owned television RTP1's morning show. But many people know me as the person who served on occasion as Sister Lucia, the seer of Fatima's interpreter. Today marks the 100th anniversary of the third apparition of Our Lady at Fatima and of the Fatima Secret, a vision divided into three parts, the vision of hell, the rise of communist Russia, its consecration and conversion, and the third secret. Therefore, I thought it opportune, for the first time in 15 years, to publicly address and clarify the English-speaking Fatima audience regarding various malicious, false information that is still circulating regarding my person and involvement with Sister Lucia and the message of Fatima. On October 11, 1992, I was privileged to have served as interpreter for Fatima Seer, Sister Lucia, during a two-hour audience that took place in the cloister of the Carmel of Quimbra with Cardinal Anthony Padiara of Ernakulam, India. During this unscheduled interview, Sister Lucia shared with us for the first time her personal views and interpretations of the Fatima message in the light of the recent fall of the Soviet Union. For many, including myself, what Sister Lucia said contradicted what had been told to us, what we had read about in the abundant Fatima literature, and what we had perceived regarding the controversial aspects of the Fatima message, the prophecies, the consecration and conversion of Russia, and the revelation of the third secret, a secret that many believed was to have been disclosed in 1960, and that many still believe has not been revealed. After the news and minutes of the meeting became public, in accordance with the Cardinal's wishes, many so-called Fatima experts, led by the late Reverend Nicholas Gruner and his many satellite pseudo-apostolates, began a ruthless campaign to silence the news of Sister Lucia's words by claiming that it was not the Fatima seer we had seen, but rather an imposter. Sister Lucia, however, laughed at all of this silliness. When the photos of the meeting were publicly disclosed, the tactics of these Fatima conspiracy theorists changed, and they turned to bribing participants to alter or censor the story, or at least not tell it at all. They also issued legal threats to the media that wished to run the story or the text of the interview, and finally took to discrediting the participants, ridiculously claiming it was a Brazilian guest that I had taken along with me and who in fact only spoke Portuguese, who had been the official interpreter. Sadly, this priest, who received the substantial payoff that I had refused to take from these enemies of the truth, so as to lie in statements that contradicted what he had previously told his own sister and her religious community at Fatima, and what he had said on film, was killed by robbers from the favelas in Brazil that discovered he had just come into a large sum of money. Following the death of the Cardinal and the Bishop, his secretary, I became the principal target of these attacks, having been maligned, defamed, bribed, physically attacked, and even kidnapped in an attempt to have me change the truth of what Sister Lucia had said, or at least to keep it secret. Many books and videos such as these ridiculously call me a conspirator, a KGB agent, and the number two enemy to the Catholic faith. But I am in good company because they do call Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, who became Pope Benedict XVI, the number one public enemy to the Catholic faith. Despite having filed and won over 12 lawsuits in Portugal for defamation, with rulings that prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that everything that these people wrote about in these books about me and circulated are lies, many articles written by these self-styled Fatima experts are still circulating on the internet, propagating countless lies about me and my family. 
I have never received any support from anyone connected to the diocese or the Fatima Shrine administration whatsoever, nor from anyone in the church for that matter in any degree of authority, except from Cardinals Anthony Padiara and Ricardo Vidal, Bishop Francis Michalapa, Sister Lucia, and her prioresses, Mother Maria de Smersij and Mother Maria Selina. But as God willed it, however, the following year of 1993, on October the 11th, the first anniversary of what became known as the Two Hours with Sister Lucia interview, I was again asked to translate for Sister Lucia during the unscheduled visit of Cardinal Ricardo Vidal of Cebu, Philippines, who brought along with him several other guests, priests, seminarians, and friends. This meeting with Sister Lucia at the Cloister of Carmel in Coimbra lasted for one hour, and during the meeting, she was asked to confirm and elaborate on what she had said the year previous. She gladly did so, and this time we were prepared. It was all videotaped. The transcription of this meeting was added to the published minutes of the two-hour interview, and the new book, Two Interviews with Sister Lucia, saw 20 editions in four languages, until the Vatican Secretary of State, Cardinal Tarsisius Bertoni, wrote his book, The Last Witness of Fatima, which clarified these matters with the preface of Pope Benedict XVI, who had been the guardian of the Third Secret and who disclosed it at Pope John Paul II's request 17 years ago this year. Most of the editions of my book have been distributed for free and any proceeds from sales given to the Carmelites or to charity. This is guaranteed by the Fatima author, Reverend Canon Monsignor José Gerald Freire, professor of the University of Coimbra, who served as chaplain of the Carmel in Coimbra and who was the world's foremost expert on Fatima. He was also my spiritual director and friend and the person who wrote the preface to the official Portuguese version of my book of the interviews with Sister Lucia. In 1998, when a religious magazine in Portugal quoted from my book on a front page article regarding what Sister Lucia had said was the role of Gorbachev in the conversion of Russia, the interviews made world headlines. But they provoked the Vatican into convoking a press conference on Fatima, the first press conference since 1960 when they decided and declared they would not reveal the third secret. For the sake of truth and my own reputation, excerpts from the videotape of the 1993 interview that was conducted in Spanish were broadcast with permission from Sister Lucia during the news on all major TV stations in Europe. Since then, they have never been transmitted again. They are, however, included in the series Mysteries of Fatima, produced by Valentin de Carvalho for RTP, and available in many languages on DVD. Boa noite. O terceiro segredo de Fátima não fala do fim do mundo, nem está mencionado em qualquer texto da Bíblia. São revelações surpreendentes da irmã Lúcia, a única vidente viva dos fenómenos da Cova da Iria. Em duas entrevistas separadas, concedidas a dois cardeais, a irmã Lúcia aconselha o Papa a não revelar o terceiro segredo de Fátima mas se o fizer, que seja com muita prudência. A segunda entrevista foi gravada por um seminarista, vídeo amador, que acompanhava os cardeais, assim que teve acesso a parte dessa gravação. Entre as declarações mais surpreendentes, a irmã Lúcia diz que foi a consagração da Rússia que evitou uma guerra nuclear. O livro esteve guardado durante seis anos em condições técnicas longe das ideais, daí as deficiências na imagem e no som de uma conversa em castelhano, já que o arcebispo filipino não compreendia português. Um dos temas abordados foi a consagração da Rússia. Nesta conversa, a vidente de Fátima diz que a conversão da Rússia está concluída. Graças aos erros daquilo que define como o comunismo ateu, está, portanto, cumprida a profecia da Virgem Maria. Não, 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 não,
foi claro o terceiro segredo de Fátima, tanto na primeira entrevista com um cardeal e um bispo indianos, como na segunda, um ano depois, com um arcebispo filipino. Entrevistadores diferentes, o um mesmo tradutor, a mesma resposta. Irmã Lúcia é a única testemunha viva das aparições de Fátima em 1917. Há 50 anos que vive em Claudura Papal, num convento de Coimbra. Em 1992 e 93, os cardeais António Padiara, da Índia, e Ricardo Vidal, das Filipinas, estiveram em Fátima. E, nas duas vezes, quiseram falar com a irmã Lúcia. O Cicerone, intérprete, foi Carlos Evaristo. In truth, few people in Europe today believe or have ever heard of these Fatima conspiracy theories. These same theories that circulate in North America to confuse and mislead many Catholics. Although at this time I will not go into Sister Lucia's interpretation of these subjects, I will, for the purpose of public clarification and due to overwhelming requests, share with you today some of the primary and explanatory excerpts of the two copyrighted interviews with Sister Lucia, during which she confirmed the following. One, the consecration of Russia was accomplished by Pope John Paul II on the 25th of March, 1984. Two, the majority of the bishops participated in it. The fact that all did not was irrelevant to the validity. And that man, Gorbachev, Sister Lucia said, was an instrument of God in the conversion process. Three, the fact that Russia was not referred to by name was also irrelevant after 1929, since the time for Russia's consecration to prevent the spread of communist atheism was, as requested by heaven, in 1929. In fact, Our Lady said in 1917, I will return to request the consecration of Russia. Our Lady did return in 1929 at Tui, Spain. It was the year that the Pope was preparing the encyclica Divinis Redentoris denouncing the errors of communist atheism. But the Pope didn't fulfill the request. Shortly afterwards, our Lord appeared to Sister Lucy and revealed that given his ministers did not heed the warning and consecrate Russia, like the King of France, who had failed to consecrate France to the Sacred Heart of Jesus to prevent the French Revolution, they too would fall into misfortune, as they did during World War II and the Cold War. Pope Pius XII did carry out a consecration in 1939, but it was too late to prevent the rise of the Soviet Union, Satan's greatest instrument to spread atheism. Russia could no longer be consecrated, it didn't exist anymore, and so the Pope consecrated the world instead, to where the errors had spread. But the various consecrations made by Pius XII, Paul VI, and Pope John Paul II were only partially complete, as they lacked the union with the bishops that Pope John Paul II finally requested in 1984. Therefore, there is no need to make any further consecration of Russia to fulfill the request of Our Lady of Fatima, although the popes and bishops can continue to consecrate, as they have, their countries, their dioceses, and those most in need, parishes, and even the new millennium, as an act of filial entrustment. After 1929, Russia became the Soviet Union, and the errors of Russia, namely atheism, the devil's greatest tool, and the greatest offense against God, since it denies his very existence, had spread to the entire world, so that now it was the world that needed consecration in order to break the devil's stronghold. In fact, Sister Lucia insisted that the consecration was so important that it prevented an atomic holocaust that was to have occurred in 1985. As I see it symbolically in the realm of pious Catholic lore, this broke the 100-year stronghold of Satan over the world, 
as granted by Christ during a vision allegedly had by Pope Leo XIII on March 25th of 1885. No greater slaughter of mankind ever occurred in the history of the world than during the conflicts of World War I, World War II, and under the rule of the communist atheist Soviet Empire. And World War II was also a war against the Jews, who according to Sister Lucia still continue to be chosen people of God, since he never took that privilege from them, despite their rejection of Christ. Also, never before was technology developed to such an extent that the human species now risks total self-annihilation. Four, the conversion of Russia has taken place. It's not the instantaneous lifting of an evil magic spell that was cast on Russia or humanity, like in the story of Sleeping Beauty. It was never intended by God or prophesied at Fatima that Russia would convert to the Catholic faith, nor to Christianity for that matter. It would be a conversion from a path of militant atheism to that of any country that respects the free will given to man by God. 5. The triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary has likewise taken place. It began when Our Lady saved Pope John Paul II's life in St. Peter's Square on May 13, 1981, and it is an ongoing process. In 1992, Sister Lucia shared that the week of Fatima was not yet concluded and that we were still living out the third day. The peace reaped from the triumph is peace from the militant spread of atheism by communist Russia. But rest assured, it does mean that in the future, no world war will take place, although local conflicts will always occur due to the nature of man. The triumph was thus over militant communist atheism, and this does not mean that all evil will disappear. Six. As prophesied by Our Lady at Fatima in 1917, the Pope would consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, but it would be too late. In the end, however, Mary's Immaculate Heart would triumph. The Pope would consecrate Russia, which would convert, and a period of peace be given to the world. Once you read this, you can see that it's all pretty straightforward. 7. In fact, everything in the Fatima message and prophecy pertains to the faith, and so the annihilation of nations did not refer to any physical war, nor a physical annihilation, but rather a spiritual one, brought about by the militant atheism of the Soviet Union, exercised in many of its occupied territories, such as Poland and Hungary. 8. The third secret was just for the Pope. It was a warning for the papacy of the 20th century, but the Pope could have revealed it if he had wanted to. Sister Lucia, however, was opposed to its public revelation because, as she said, it was just for the Pope. So now what? Well, it's up to us to re-evangelize, because after the threat of world war has ended, with the end of the Soviet communist system, materialism is on the rise. Fatima is thus the answer to a request for help from the papacy, during the deadlock of World War I, when all of the world's youth were being slaughtered. Pope Benedict XV invoked Our Lady for the first time by the title Regina Pacis on May the 5th, 1917. Days later, Our Lady appeared at Fatima to give the Pope the formula for world peace. Our Lady never said that the secret was to be revealed by 1960. It was Sister Lucia's opinion that before 1960, it would not be understood. And if the popes chose to read it or disclose it to the public, they would have difficulty in comprehending its message. Likewise, she believed that in Portugal, the dogma of the faith would always be preserved. Many ask, how can this be possible? or state that this simply cannot be true because of the current situation and with the various anti-Catholic laws passed by the Portuguese government. 
Well, this was Sister Lucia's opinion. She added these words, and they referred to her belief that the dogma of the Immaculate Conception would always be defended by the Portuguese as they have since 1646, centuries before it was defined as such by Pope Pius IX, when Our Lady of Conception was crowned Queen and Patroness of Portugal. Pope Pius XII, when he crowned Our Lady at Fatima as Queen of the World in 1946, said he was now extending her reign to the entire world. And what is Sister Lucia's great message to the world today? It's he that is not with the Pope is not with God, and he that wants to be with God has to be with the Pope. And why? because he is God's greatest representative on earth. What Sister Lucia told us during these two visits, she repeated on many other occasions to various persons that were also privileged to visit with her. Not only cardinals and dignitaries, but also her relatives and even my own family and friends. Guests like John and Patricia Hafford, Fred and Catherine Zugaby, and even Mel Gibson and his wife met with Sister Lucia on different occasions, community celebrations and events that many were invited to attend at the convent where Sister Lucia was always present. to meet with Sister Lucia on April 28, 2002. My husband gave a talk on the crucifixion and suffering of Jesus. So I asked her a question. I think, was Russia consecrated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary uh, or not? Because I've been hearing uh, rumors uh, that it had not been properly consecrated. And with that, the nuns all bristled when they heard the name Father Gruner, and we thought we were going to be thrown out. But uh, we went, she went on to say, and Sister looked us close. She was only about the tops two feet away from us. She looked at us straight in the eye and said, yes, it was done. The Holy Father willed it to be done. And she said, please, go tell all your friends. It was done. So that was good enough for us. And so we've been telling a lot of our friends the real story about it. Uh, a lot of people are under the misconception that, that everything should be hunky-dory in uh, Russia. Uh, there are no more prostitution, no more no nothing. Sin. No sin. Just a, uh, no sin. state of utopia. However, Sister Lucy said what it gave them was free will to choose, uh, uh, to choose whether they wanted to go to church, whether they wanted Catholicism or not. If not, if they wanted to pick the uh, wrong way, that would be their future. They're permitted to be virtuous, too. It appears that every time that someone tries to say that Sister Lucy said that Russia was consecrated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, suddenly people say that photograph is not Sister Lucy. It's definitely Sister Lucy. So during the 100th anniversary of Fatima, I thought it was opportune to set the record straight and, despite risking harsh criticism, to honor Sister Lucia and what she said regarding some of the most controversial issues of Fatima. Whether you or I agree with it is besides the point, as the fact of the matter is that it was Sister Lucia who said these things and this was her opinion expressed freely. She believed it wholeheartedly 
and she was unquestionably the spokesperson for Our Lady of Fatima. She was the only person living who had ever been assured she would go to heaven when she died, and this since the promise of Christ on the cross to the good thief St. Dismas. But it's understandable that many, despite the truth, will prefer to believe lies and fantasies, continue to persecute and defame the innocent who speak the truth, for they prefer to defend Fatima conspiracies and so-called Fatima experts. The message of Fatima in Sister Lucia's opinion boils down to one thing. It's not for everyone. It's like the message of the angels at the birth of Christ in Bethlehem. The angels said, peace on earth to men of good will. They did not say peace on earth to everyone, knowing that some people not being of good will are never going to be at peace with others. Those who are of good will will find an abundance of blessings and miracles in the events of history as seen in the light of Fatima. Those who are not of good will, however, will never find peace in its message or in its true interpretation. During this anniversary, it's important that we forgive those who have misinterpreted the message of Fatima or have persecuted its apostles. May Our Lady, through the intercession of the Angel of Portugal and Angel of Peace, help them to find peace. May she lead all souls to heaven, especially those most in need of God's mercy. Until next time, God bless.